hands-on labs, but really what they're doing is just giving you a couple of files to download and you're still having to use your own environment. Well, on linuxacademy.com and our hands-on labs, we are actually providing you for a temporary amount of time an AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, or Linux-based environment for you to use. Now, this is again free of charge and included as part of our hands-on labs. So if you see here, when I click on start activity or start this particular lab here for introduction to AWS identity and access management, what's gonna happen here is that you are going to be provided with a link and login credentials to a real live AWS environment. And the same thing will happen if you happen to be taking a Google app, an Azure lab, or a Linux or DevOps based lab. So by clicking on open console here and going back and copying the credentials here, cloud user, I'll just use this as an example. We'll see here that I'm now logged in to a real live AWS environment. This is, again is 100% included and at no charge to you. And then what we have here in the labs, we have a video which is going to walk us through the hands-on step-by-step processes that we need to take in order to complete the objectives and the tasks that are laid out for this particular lab. So again, one of the really cool things that Linux Academy provides to you is real live environments for you to get real hands-on practical experience in either Linux or various cloud platforms. When it comes to flashcards, so you may have used flashcards in high school, college, or university, and you can come in here and build your own flashcard decks or use any one of our instructor prepared flashcard decks for all of the courses that we offer on linuxacademy.com. And you can build them yourself, you can create your own card, or you can use the ones that are already created here. And again, this is just a front and back card, which you can use to study, memorize various definitions and key terms. We also have a robust student community over on Linux Academy. So you can come here, you can ask questions, you can read any of our uh, written guides, and you can interact with other students as well as the instructional staff here at Linux Academy. So again, those are just three of the main benefits of having a Linux Academy Community Edition account with, I think, the best benefit being access to our hands-on labs through utilizing our GEM system, which I will get to later on in this video after we get you signed up. So now to sign up for your free Linux Academy Community Edition account, all you need to do is find the resource link underneath the video that you are currently watching. So in each course here that we offer on Udemy, you're going to see a lesson, the lesson that you're watching right now is called Free Linux Academy Community Account. Right underneath, there's going to be a resource link. All you have to do is click on that resource link and it is going to bring up our signup page for our free community edition account. So all you need to do is go ahead and fill in this form and click on join now and then log into Linux Academy to access your free Linux Academy community edition account. Now this is 100% free. You do not have to put in a credit card. The only information that is required is what is on this form right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this filled out and logged into a community edition account. Great, once you get to the welcome screen, you can just go ahead and click on getting started. And now I do have to log in again for the first time, so I'm gonna go ahead and put in my credentials again. So now that you're into your Linux Academy Community Edition account, what are the things you know in order to take advantage of some of the features that we offer as part of this Udemy course? Well, the three main features that I wanna cover are hands-on labs, flashcards, as well as our student community. So first, let's touch on the student community. The student community is a place that you can go by hovering over community and clicking on interact with students. And here you can ask questions of the community. So this, these are questions that you can ask that will be answered by Linux Academy staff and or other students. Now let's say for a particular course that you want to view the flashcards. Let's use an example here of the AWS Essentials course. So what you can do is you can click on the magnifying glass over here and type in AWS Essentials or the name of whatever course it is that you are currently taking. In our advanced search here, it should come up. I'm gonna click on AWS Essentials. 
And we see here, this is labeled as a community edition course, which means that the video lessons are currently free for anybody that has a community edition account. But you click here on flashcards, and if you scroll down, you will see a section called Instructor Decks. Now, this is a deck that has been created by our instructor for the AWS Essentials course, Tia Williams. So you can click View This Deck, and you see here that you have flashcards to study from, just like you may have used in college or university. Now, you can fork these out into your own decks. You can also write your own flashcards as well by using the Add Card option up here. So that is how you use the flashcard feature of the Linux Academy Community Edition account. Now, when it comes to accessing our hands-on labs, that is something that is limited to individuals that are on our Community Edition account because you have to use gems in order to access hands-on labs. And each hands-on lab comes with a specific gem cost. Now, when you first sign up for your Community Edition account, you start with 35 gems. Now, that is going to be enough gems to take however many hands-on labs have been assigned to you as an option in the particular Udemy a course that you are currently taking. So now let's go back to the course syllabus for the AWS Essentials course as an example. As you scroll down, you're going to see hands-on labs throughout the course syllabus. So this is gonna be one way that you can access the particular hands-on labs. However, in the course on Udemy, in each one of the hands-on lab assignments, there are going to be direct links to these labs so you don't have to navigate to the syllabus on Linux Academy and find them yourself. But if we click on this one here, we're going to see that in order to start the activity, there is an eight gem cost. So when I click to start this activity, it is going to reduce eight gems from the 35. So it's very important that if you are taking a course on Udemy and you want to be able to use all of the recommended labs on the Udemy syllabus, that you only start the labs that are recommended in the syllabus. If you go into other courses or start other labs, then you're probably not going to have enough gems to complete or start all of the recommended labs that we have curated for you and put in the Udemy syllabus for the course that you are currently taking. So now let's make our way back over to the Udemy syllabus. So now, whether you're taking the AWS Concepts course, the AWS Essentials course, the Google or Azure Concepts course, or even the DevOps Essentials course, so any course that you may be taking in the particular syllabus, as you scroll down, you're going to see these assignments. Now, these are going to be in the bonus sections. They'll be labeled as optional, and these are going to be what you're going to click on when you want to take a particular hands-on lab. So if you click on any one of these, you can go ahead and click on start assignment. And what we're going to do here is you're going to see a video and this is going to give you specific instructions on how to log in and navigate to the particular hands-on lab that we want you to take at this particular time. So each assignment has a different hands-on lab associated with it. And there are specific links and instructions here and in the video, which is going to tell you how to access that particular hands-on lab. And then once you're done taking the hands-on lab over on the Linux Academy side, you can just come back here, click on next to finish up the assignment, and then you'll be taken back to the dashboard on your particular syllabus, and then you can move on to the next item on the syllabus and complete the course. Now again, this is all completely optional as part of your Udemy course, but we invite you to enjoy this free offering by linuxacademy.com. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask us in the Udemy question and answer section or our community here on Linux Academy. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. Hello, and welcome to this Azure lesson. Today, we'll be looking at cloud concepts, and specifically, we'll be looking at the benefits and the considerations of using cloud services. In this lesson, we'll be looking at three concepts that each tie together to provide numerous advantages to using cloud computing. And those three concepts are high availability, fault tolerance, and disaster recovery. So let's start by taking a look at the interactive diagram on the right side of my screen. And we'll go through each of these three concepts and make sure that we know what each one of them means and how they can each help us to achieve the best possible applications and systems. As we go through these concepts, let's try to think about each one in terms of what it would cost us to replicate in our own data centers instead of using Azure. 
So on the diagram on the right part of my screen, we'll start with high availability, which already should be selected. And high availability is the ability to maintain an acceptable continuous performance despite temporary load fluctuations or failures in services, hardware, or data centers. And the key point here is to maintain acceptable continuous performance, which is in bold. And that means that even if traffic varies to our site, if it increases greatly or decreases greatly, or in fact, if certain Azure services fail, if some hardware fails, or in fact, if an entire data center fails, our applications and systems can still maintain acceptable continuous performance. And so let's take a look at how Azure does that. And it's based on redundancies at every level. So we'll start at the finest level, which is a single individual data center within Azure. And we'll look at the redundancies employed there to make sure that everything stays up as much as possible. First off with power, the power systems in these Azure data centers are fully redundant. It's not uncommon for a data center to be able to generate its own power. And as well, there might be different providers of power coming into the data center. So if one has an interruption, the other stays up. And there's also redundancies in the power generation, the power battery backups, and systems like that. There's also redundancies with the cooling systems. They might use a combination of different cooling approaches, like water cooling and air cooling. And they might have redundancies as well with the providers that they use to power and to fuel those cooling systems. And additionally, with the networking equipment, like switches and routers and other networking hardware, all of those are fully redundant in Azure data centers as well. And in fact, there might be multiple internet service providers coming into the data centers as well. So again, if one is actually down or has an interruption, the other one can stay up and service the needs of the data center. So within an Azure data center, there's redundancies at nearly every level. But in case something happens to an entire data center, we can step up a level from the data center and go to availability zones and reap even more redundancies there. So an availability zone is essentially a grouping of one or more data centers put together. And in this capacity, you can deploy your apps and your systems to multiple different availability zones, for example. Let's say we deploy to two availability zones. If a data center in one availability goes down, we still might be deployed to a second data center in that same availability zone, and our applications and systems can stay up. Now, moving to a higher level, what happens if an entire availability zone somehow goes down through either a natural disaster or some sort of emergency? Well, the higher level up from availability zones is a region, and a region encompasses multiple availability zones put together. In fact, let's take a look at the left side of my screen, and we can see on Microsoft's site that Azure has 54 regions worldwide at the time of this filming, and it's available in 140 countries around the world. So pretty much no matter where you are in the world, you're most likely pretty close to an Azure region, if not directly in one. And at the very least, you should have access to the Azure cloud for your business. Now within a region, a region groups multiple availability zones put together, and that's kind of reflected in the images at the bottom of the interactive diagram. On the left, we see a fictitious region one, and we see three availability zones, one, two, and three. And within each one of those, we see two data centers. And you can kind of see now how the redundancies stack together. Again, starting from the data center level, there's multiple redundancies in all the utilities and the infrastructure at the data center. But if something were to happen to a single data center, if we've deployed to availability zones, our application and system may still be in a second data center that's not affected and keep up and running. Likewise, if some sort of accident or disaster happens that affects an entire availability zone, we have the option to deploy our apps and systems across multiple availability zones. So even if one goes down, the data centers in the other availability zone can pick up the slack and continue to host our applications and systems and will stay up and running. And finally, if an entire region somehow goes down, all the availability zones and all the data centers in the region, we can take advantage of using multiple regions within Azure. So if, for example, East US goes down because of some freak accident, we could also be deployed in West US, and none of our applications or systems would actually go down because our second region would pick up the load. 
And so it's a pretty powerful way through all these redundancies for Azure to maintain acceptable continuous performance despite any of these fluctuations in load or failures. Now the next thing we'll look at is fault tolerance. And this refers to a system's ability to continue to operate properly when one or more of its components fail. And there's really two ways that we can look at becoming fault tolerant. We can use proactive options and we can use reactive options. So starting with proactive, some proactive ways to handle faults when they occur to make sure our systems continue operating properly are to regularly back up our data, apps, and our resources. And that way, if something does happen, we're ready to restore them as needed and get back up and running. We can also deploy to multiple availability zones or regions, like I mentioned earlier, to make sure that if one availability zone or region goes down, our systems are in another one, and they will stay up because of that. Now, when we do that, we can also load balance across multiple availability zones or regions. So even if one does go down, our traffic will automatically be rerouted to the availability zone or region that's up, and it will be transparent to us. And we won't see any failures because of that. And finally, we can monitor the health of our data, apps, and resources to anticipate any problems and to handle them as quickly as possible. So these are approaches that we can take before a fault actually happens to make sure that we can recover from it as soon as possible. And some of these options outright mitigate any errors because they spread our applications across different regions, so they're in at least one area that's not affected. Now, let's look at reactive approaches. If something does happen that takes our systems offline, we can react to that to get our apps up as quickly as possible. And one way we can do that is to restore our data, apps, and resources to a different environment, like a different availability zone or a region. And that way, we'll get back up and running as quickly as possible. And as well, if one of our availability zones or regions is down, we can simply target a different availability zone or region and deploy our assets there, and again, be back up and running as quickly as possible. So with Azure, there's a few mechanisms in place to either try to avoid failures in the first place, like deploying to multiple availability zones or regions, as well as when a fault does happen, to be able to recover from it as quickly as possible using backups and restoring them. And that kind of segues into our next topic, which is disaster recovery. And that is a system's ability to backup and restore data, apps, and resources when needed. And we can do this in a variety of ways. If we have on-premise data centers, like in the image at the bottom of the diagram, let's say we have data centers A and B, we can store all of our backups of our data, apps, and resources in Azure. And we can restore from our data center A to our data center B using Azure as a middleman, just to store the copies of our backed up data. So in that way, we can restore from on-premises to on-premises data centers. Also, we can take a different approach. If our data center A goes out, we can store our backups in Azure and immediately restore to Azure. And in that capacity, we'll be restoring from on-premises data centers to Azure cloud data centers. Additionally, if our assets are in a different cloud, such as AWS, we can store the backups of our data, apps, and resources in Azure, and we can restore to Azure. And in that capacity, we can restore from other cloud services directly to Azure. And finally, if our applications already live in Azure, we can keep all of our backups inside of Azure as well, ideally in multiple different regions for protection. And in the case of an outage in one region or availability zone, we can just deploy to a second region or availability zone within Azure. And in that way, we're restoring from Azure to Azure. So as you can see, there are a couple different ways we can accomplish disaster recovery. When a disaster does strike, whether it's to our own data center, another cloud service data center, or an Azure data center, we have the available options we need in order to restore our services and get them back up and running. So one last thing before we finish out this video, there's a link in the description of this video, and I encourage you to check it out. It is a really cool video that Microsoft put out that gives you a tour of an actual Azure data center. So if you'd like, go ahead and click the link and you'll click on the little green man that starts at the front door. And when we do that, it'll go into a video section that has a couple different sections going over everything we just talked about. We'll start at the lobby. We'll move to the server room, which we can see here on the screen. They'll go over all the cooling systems they use in the Azure data centers, as well as the power systems and how they keep everything modular.
It's a really cool video and I encourage you to check it out if you'd like to learn a little bit more about these redundancies and how they keep Azure data centers up and online as much as possible. So if you have the time, check it out. Otherwise, that's going to wrap it up for this lesson. I hope you learned something and I hope you had fun participating. If you'd like, go ahead and grab a quick break and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome to this Azure lesson. Today, we'll be looking at cloud concepts and specifically the benefits and considerations of using cloud services. In this lesson, we'll be looking at two concepts that tie together to provide one of the key advantages to using cloud computing. And those two concepts are scalability and elasticity. So let's start by taking a look at the interactive diagram on the right side of my screen, and we'll go through each of these three concepts and make sure we know what they mean and how they can help us achieve the best possible applications and systems. As we go through both of these concepts, let's also try to think about each one in terms of what it would cost us to replicate in our own data centers. So starting with scalability, scalability is the ability to increase the instance count or size of our existing resources. And we can do this in two different ways. We can scale out, which will increase the instance count of our existing resources. And what that means, based on the image at the bottom of the diagram, is that we can increase the count of our servers, for example. So we start on the left with one server, and we're able to scale out and go from one to four servers, and in fact, even more, go from four to six servers. And each server is going to share the same profile, that is to say they'll have the same CPU and RAM and hard drive resources. We're just adding more of them to the pool of servers that can handle our requests. And when we do this, this is a non-disruptive change. And what that means is we don't have to take any machines offline to scale out. All we have to do is add an extra server to the pool of servers that we have to handle our requests, and it's automatically available to take some load off the other servers. And so scaling out is increasing the number of servers that we have to handle more requests. There's a different type of scaling as well, which is called scaling up. Scaling up doesn't increase the count of our servers, but rather the size of our servers. And that is to say the CPU, RAM, and hard drive profiles that the server is using. So for example, if we look at the image at the bottom, let's say we start with a server that has one CPU and four gigabytes of RAM. As our workload increases, not necessarily the traffic to our site, but as the workload that each server has to perform increases, we can scale our servers up and go from one CPU and four gigabytes of RAM to potentially two CPUs and let's say eight gigabytes of RAM. And as our workload increases even more, we can go to yet a bigger machine and let's say we'll move to a four CPU, 16 gigabyte RAM machine. And so in this way, we can take an existing machine and add more resources to it so it can perform more work at an individual server level. But keep this in mind that scaling up, unlike scaling out, is actually disruptive in that we have to first bring down the existing machine, let's say our first server with one CPU, before we can put online a second machine that will replace it with higher CPU and RAM. So there are two ways, essentially, to scale, whether it's scaling out or scaling up. Both allow us the flexibility to increase our resources as we need based on either the traffic to our site or the workload that our site's performing. Now, building on top of scalability, we'll take a look at elasticity. And elasticity, we can think of the entire Azure cloud as a rubber band, so to speak. We can pull on the rubber band and make it bigger, and we can stop pulling on it and make it smaller. And just like that, elasticity is the ability to increase or decrease the instance count or size of our existing resources, and doing that based on fluctuations in traffic or load to our site, or in the workload that our site has to perform. And in this capacity, we can scale in both directions. We can scale out and increase the number of servers, and we can scale in and decrease the number of servers. And likewise, we can scale up and increase the size of our servers, as well as scale down and decrease the size of our servers. And facilitating this elasticity can be a manual or an automatic process. In fact, many services within Azure facilitate rules that allow you to auto-scale based on CPU, RAM usage, etc. 
Also, we can make it manual if there is a, for example, a business process that needs to be followed in which a certain person has to approve a change. We can facilitate things like that by going with manual elasticity and manual scaling through some scripts or code of our own. And the important thing to remember with elasticity is that it's based on changes in load or workload to our applications and servers. And in that capacity, we have this kind of automatic ability to respond to changes in our applications and the load in our applications and adjust the amount of resources we have accordingly. And one of the biggest key benefits of the cloud that has to do with this elasticity and this auto scaling is that by doing it, we can eventually just pay only for what we're using. If we need to bring an extra one server or even an extra 100 servers online temporarily to handle an increase in our traffic, we're only paying for those extra 100 servers for the hour or two that they're brought online. When they auto-scale back down and we no longer need them, we're no longer paying for them. And so you can see sort of the same concept in the diagram at the bottom. We may start with one single node, and as our traffic and workload increases, we'll see on the right that we now have seven different nodes in this example. And likewise, these are created on demand as the load to our applications dictates. And when that load drops and we no longer need seven servers, we can move back the other direction and go back to one. Now this shows scaling out, but it could very well as be scaling up as well. We could interpret this image as one CPU, for example, in a single server, and scale that up to seven CPUs. So the diagram works really in both directions. You can picture this as scaling out or scaling up or both even. And again, this is expanded or reduced as needed. So it's really directly tied to the load and the traffic and the workload of our applications. So keep in mind that this is really one of the core benefits of the cloud in general is the ability to pay for only what we're using and respond to changes in our applications in real time and be able to provision all the resources we need to handle that extra load. You can imagine that doing this in our own data centers would be very, very costly. Having to buy servers, set them up, manage and maintain them, and then when our load drops, what do we do? We have to sell them to get our money back, and we're not going to get very much money back for them, maybe a quarter of what we paid. So it's a very costly thing to constantly keep provisioning all these servers and then let them sit idle when we don't need them anymore. So finally, one last thing before we close out this video, you can find this link in the description of this video. But there's an extra page on Microsoft's site where if you'd like to learn a little bit more about not just scaling and scaling up and scaling out, but also some of the auto scaling processes within Azure, I really highly encourage you to take a look at this article. It's a quick read, maybe 15 minutes. And they go into some great depth about how you can configure auto scaling for various Azure services, what the different types of scaling are, and things like that. So thanks very much for joining this lesson. I hope you learned something in the process, and I hope you had fun participating. If you'd like, go ahead and grab a quick break. And when you're ready, I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this Azure lesson. Today, we'll be looking at cloud concepts and specifically the benefits and the considerations of using cloud services. In this lesson, we'll be looking at how we can gain business agility by using the Azure cloud. So let's start by taking a look at the interactive diagram on the right side of my screen, and we'll go through each of the ways listed that we can gain more business agility by using Azure and the cloud. So business agility is an organization's ability to rapidly adapt to market and environmental changes in productive and cost-effective ways, and how we can take advantage of available resources to meet our customers' demands. So that's a mouthful, but let's simplify that and say it's our ability to rapidly adapt to any kind of change, whether it be business, political, etc., and to provide our customers the best possible product and to do that in the most productive and cost-effective way. So the first point we'll look at is a focus on time to value. And what that means is we want to get new products to market as soon as possible. We want shorter feedback cycles on our products, whether they're with customers or internal employees. And ultimately, we want a faster return on our investment. Azure helps us in all of these ways by shortening the amount of time that's needed to provision new resources or to scale our resources out and up. 
And by being able to focus more on the business rather than IT management, we are able to get our products to market as quickly as possible and to shorten those feedback cycles. Also, there's a focus on innovation within business. We always want to look for better ways of doing things and using newer and better technologies. And Azure allows us to do that by, again, concentrating less on IT management and more on our business. With the cheaper cost of Azure, with paying only for what we use, we can instead focus our money not on data centers and servers, but rather on employees and ideas to make our products better. And as well, we can take advantage of all of the technologies that are on Azure, maybe ones that are financially out of reach for us in our own data centers, like giant clusters of servers or blockchain servers and things like that. And instead, we can only pay for the limited resources we use and invest more money in the products of our business and the ideas of our business in our people, which will lead to more innovation. Also, we're going to look at low latency. And what this refers to is the latency in when a business makes the decision until when they know if that decision was right or wrong. And we're looking at that because the sooner a decision can be acted upon, the sooner the business knows whether that decision was right or wrong and what else needs to be done. And with Azure, with the ability to provision even hundreds or thousands of servers immediately and have them up and running, that costs us a lot less time and money in the long run from having to purchase and configure and install those servers in our own data center. And instead, lets us focus on immediately deploying to Azure and evaluating the business value of these decisions or applications. So it takes a complicated process of IT management away from us and instead lets us focus on just our business. And in doing that, we can respond a lot quicker to the market. Next, we'll look at economic effectiveness. We want to be as cost effective as possible in our processes and our use of resources. And again, with Azure, with being able to pay for only what we use and to be able to provision immediately hundreds or thousands of servers, we're treating IT in the most cost effective way possible. We no longer have to maintain our own data centers, which potentially cost millions of dollars a year. We no longer have to maintain as much staff to manage our IT resources in our data center. And we no longer have to buy extra servers and let them sit idle during the times that we don't have extra traffic. Instead, we can rely on scaling and elasticity of the Azure cloud and paying for only what we use. And we can achieve great economic effectiveness in our IT budget simply by using the cloud instead of our own data centers. Next, we'll look at rapid adaptation. And this means our ability as a business to quickly adapt to changes in the market. And again, going on the same points that I've mentioned earlier, with Azure giving us the ability to immediately deploy any number and type of resources that we need, we're able to rapidly adapt to changes in the market. For example, if something were to happen and the business decided that there is an opportunity to capitalize upon, but maybe we need 10,000 servers of a certain type to do it. We no longer need an upfront investment of millions of dollars to do that. We can simply go to Azure, provision the servers, and pay just for what we're using while we're using it. And we're quickly able to adapt to market conditions by getting our IT resources provisioned and configured as quickly as possible, sometimes instantaneously with the Azure cloud. And all of this adds up to give our business more flexibility in the long run. As we're able to move quickly to take advantage of new opportunities, our business becomes more flexible. We can take advantage of new markets or new areas that the business wasn't previously involved in. And it makes us more flexible to changes that might otherwise be disadvantageous to some of our competitors. And so Azure as a whole, with regions around the world, with redundancies to make sure that we have high availability, with the ability to recover from faults and disasters, really gives us flexibility in our business to concentrate just on business problems and not managing an IT infrastructure. And so you can see how all these six items kind of play together and focus on the same themes, but they all mean one thing for your business. You'll be running a better business at the end of the day if you can focus less on these boilerplate IT management processes and focus more on putting your time and money into your actual business.
And with Azure, we can do that without worrying if our IT resources are online or if we have enough money to buy all the IT resources we need in our own data center. Instead, we can quickly and simply provision just what we need within Azure, have it up and running immediately, and pay only for what we use. And more of our business time is spent on business ideas. And so that about wraps it up for this section on business agility. I hope you had fun and I hope you learned something in the process. I know I sure did. If you'd like, go ahead and grab a quick break. And when you're ready, I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, and welcome to our video on understanding subscriptions in the Azure Concepts series. The goal of our video today is to provide a high-level introduction to Microsoft Azure using an oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference that helps you move forward. So in the context of our video today, what that means is that we're going to discuss how Azure structures its subscriptions and its usage for you as an organization or you as an administrator. And we're going to do that in a way that allows us to look at a similar structure in something completely unrelated. We're actually going to look at how your neighborhood is structured and how that's similar to an Azure subscription uh, and the components within Azure. And that will give you a frame of reference to understand what people are talking about when they talk about tenants or subscriptions or resource groups. So let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Excuse me, not the video, but our diagram. Let's jump right into our diagram. So I've got a diagram here. This is going to be in your course materials for you to download. And this diagram has several uh, sections. We're going to be focusing today on the subscription section, which is up here. And then we're also going to look at this one that's just called Your Neighborhood. The remainder of these uh, sections here are about other pieces of Azure, and we'll cover them in other videos. So first, I'm going to tell you the names of these uh, different sections in Azure, and then we're going to go over to the Your Neighborhood tab and talk about how those are similar to pieces of a neighborhood or sections of your house. So in Azure, we have the concept of a subscription. You can have more than one subscription, but a subscription covers resources in multiple Azure regions and can contain tenants, and multiple resource groups and resources. Now let's look at the neighborhood diagram now and see how those are similar so we can understand what is actually contained in each one of these and then we'll come right back and talk a little more in detail about each one of these containers or organizational units. So if you live in a neighborhood, uh, you have several organizational units that get smaller and smaller. So in our in our Azure diagram here, a neighborhood is similar to a subscription. It's a collection of multiple resources, multiple houses, and there are possibly multiple families or people living in all those houses that are responsible for the administration, maintenance, and upkeep of all the things in that house. Inside your neighborhood, you might have multiple yards with a fence. <clears throat> Inside that yard with a fence might also be your house, maybe a home office, maybe your garage, but it's an area that you as an administrator might be responsible for. And it's tied to a physical location, which is an important thing to understand when we're talking about Azure regions. Azure regions are geographically separate locations that contain resources. They're actually data centers that exist in different parts of the world and we house our resources in those data centers or regions because they either have the availability of the resources or products that we want, or they're physically closer to our customers so we can serve them. So you can think of that region much as you can like a yard with a fence. And if you had bought, if, let's say you own two lots or you might, uh, there might be someone who owns multiple homes or yards or something within a neighborhood, maybe they're rental homes, those, that, that, those yards are like separate regions. Um, there are different products contained within them. They're physically separate, but they might share some connections or they might share some common ownership, which would be either uh, physically they're in the same neighborhood uh, or you, um, you as a owner, as a landlord might own them. Within that yard with a fence, we might have something like a house. 
inside the house, we're going to have users and groups. We're going to have maybe a family uh, with multiple people who have access to that. And within that house, those people actually have access to the other things that are next to us here, the resource groups. And inside those resource groups are things like in a home office, like a computer, or in a garage, like a vehicle. So the tenant is actually like the list of people who who live in that house and also the list of things that they're allowed to do. So maybe you have uh, two parents and an older child, uh, someone over 16, and they are allowed to use the gr car in the garage. And maybe you have a child who's 10 who's not allowed to use the car in the garage. And so that brings us to the smallest organizational unit, which is the resource group. So a resource group is something logical uh, that goes together and those resources might be used by the same group of people or they might be turned on or off at the same time uh, or there might be some sort of security reason to keep them separate so in the case of the home office well maybe there's some sensitive information that it needs to be locked up and maybe only one person uh, in the family needs to have access to that home office uh, or maybe it's um, an individual's bedroom or something like that there's a reason to separate those resources into that logical unit and same thing with the garage. The garage contains a piece of equipment that we don't want in the house itself, but needs to have its own logical unit. So that's what goes in the garage here. So now let's take a look at the subscription and understand how these things are named and how they're similar to what these, to these uh, units or organizational uh, groups we just described here. So like we said, we have a subscription, an Azure region, and a tenant, and a resource group. In the resource group here, we might have a SQL database or an Azure storage blob. In a separate resource group, we might have virtual machines. And then finally, in our tenant here, we might have user groups and users. And that tenant is actually also called an Azure Active Directory. Those two terms are synonymous, a tenant and an Azure Active Directory. All those things might be housed in an Azure region, and you could have multiple regions uh, resources with, within multiple regions, within multiple resource groups housed within a single subscription. And there are various reasons that we would want to separate our things this way. Again, we said that it might make sense for administrative purposes to have things grouped together so that one user is responsible for all the resources in a single resource group. It's possible that we might want to group things together for billing reasons. So everything from the accounting department might be in its own subscription. Uh, we also might have inwardly facing applications and outwardly facing applications. So maybe we have a tenant for all of our corporate users and employees and contractors, and maybe we have a tenant that houses the user credentials for a website that we uh, administrate or is a business that our company provides to customers. So that's the basic description of Azure subscriptions and the organizational units within Azure subscriptions. Uh, again, to go back over the high level, uh, the frame of reference that we want you to have here is that there are multiple ways to organize Azure subscriptions and resources. And we might have multiple reasons for doing them, and Azure gives you these various tools with different components and different parameters and different features to organize your resources and your Azure subscription however you would like. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again in the next video. Hi, and welcome to our video on understanding Active Directory in our Azure Concept series. The goal of our video today is again to provide a high-level introduction to Microsoft Azure using oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference that helps you move forward. What that means with regards to Azure Active Directory is that we're going to explain to you why a company would use an Azure Active Directory and then how that Azure Active Directory makes Azure unique amongst cloud providers. So let's go ahead and go to our diagram here. So in our diagram, we're now on the Active Directory tab <clears throat> and we are taking a look at how uh, Azure organizes user accounts and credentialing within its system and how those credentials relate to uh, resource access of resource within its system and also to access of resources outside its system. So 
Microsoft has always had this concept of an Active Directory where you have a set of user credentials and within that Active Directory, you not only have information about who that user is, what department they might have, might be in, and what, uh, or where they might fit in your organizational chart, but it also controls their access to resources within your computer network. Well, Azure, uh, Microsoft has taken that, that same concept and moved it to Azure. And not only have they taken it and moving it to, moved it to Azure, but they've also expanded its role and expanded the feature set that it has uh, and helps uh, in, in a way that helps IT administrators um, link Azure Active Directory credentials to outside um, software services as well. So what that means is that when you use Azure Active Directory, you can have the same username and password uh, in your Azure Active Directory as you might for accessing your email through Office 365 or maybe uh, to access an in-house application that your company uses to manage um, CRM or uh, uses to create customer orders. Or maybe it also ties into SaaS services that your company uses like Dropbox or uh, GoToAssist or uh, GoToMeeting or any of those type applications. All of those things are possible to tie into Azure Active Directory so that when your user logs on, all they have to remember is a single username and password, and then they can connect to all these services that your business uses, consumes, or provides. So in addition to allowing it, you to do that for your users, Azure Active Directory also provides a way for you to onboard consultants to access your Azure resource, resources. So if you have a uh, consultant that is going to help you manage your virtual machines or your network, uh, they can log on with their credentials tied to your Active Directory and immediately with no additional configuration or no user, another username issued, they can have access to the resources you want them to. And not only that, we can actually take that same concept and extend it to a consumer website. So let's say your business is a technology company and they provide a SaaS service to their end users. Well, we can set up a B2C Azure Directory, Active Directory, that allows us to house the user credentials for our web application. And those user credentials can actually come from other social identity providers like Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc. By doing that, we allow our users to sign up with a credential they already know and manage their credentials and their subscriptions to our website through an interface that they're already familiar with uh, and we can also make sure that they are all tied together uh, if they want to have multiple applications that are integrated and working together. So let's take a look at our diagram. I'm sorry, I diverged a little bit there away from the diagram, but I want to come back to this. So I'm going to just read these points here and talk about each one of them individually. So Azure Active Directory is like an org chart, phone book, and access list all rolled into one service. So that's what we just talked about. It, it not only has your org chart and your phone book and your access list, it actually works with certain services with Office 365 to provide things like instant messaging and phone service. So through things like Skype for Business, uh, you can have instant messaging, you can have uh, direct phone calls with users, and those all work through the Azure Active Directory. So your same user credentials provide you with an easy way for you to interact with other people um, in your company and your team. So the next part is about the Azure B2C. So by including an Azure Active Directory as a central feature to Azure, Microsoft allows businesses to focus on core product development. So in the past, development of the actual code to handle user usernames and passwords credentials, uh, it was a tedious task and was also prone to um, opening your company up to lots of security risks if it was not handled properly. Well, by using an Azure Active Directory, especially a B2C Active Directory, you can offload that development work to Microsoft. And Microsoft has spent a lot of time and effort and development dollars in providing a great system to handle user credentialing. So they handle already the encryption of passwords. They handle um, the, the self-service password reset. All of those things, the multi-factor authentication, all those things that make for a great 
um, and secure credentialing system Microsoft has already developed. So you can focus on just creating the application that you want for your business and not spend developer time and money on creating something that's already been done. And that's actually tied into this next point as well. So developers can offload the tedious task of managing users and the privacy concerns around their data. Uh, and then here's the last one. Um, actually, one of the things that I like best about Azure Active Directory is it, it allows you to have a single source of truth for all your business applications. So we also discussed that as well. It is the single place where you can store usernames and passwords that allow your users to have access to all the applications they want. And it's something that I think as IT managers, um, it provides a huge uh, relief of pressure on day-to-day day-to-day um, uh, -day tasks or day-to-day -day, you know, tickets, help tickets that might come up in your environment uh, where users are looking for help because they've forgotten a password to this or they've forgotten how to access that or they don't know uh, how to get onto this or that. There are a number of products that Azure has included in Active Directory that address all those concerns and make it a very, very simple system uh, to operate from an administrator's point of view and also a simple system to use um, as an end user. So that's Azure Active Directory. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this video and please join us for another one. Thanks. Hi, and welcome to our video on understanding virtual networks in our Azure Concept Series. The goal of our video today is to provide a high-level introduction to Microsoft Azure using oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference that helps you move forward. What does that mean in context of virtual networks? Well, virtual networks are our roadways for our communication between our devices in Azure or our resources. If you go back to our diagram here and we go back to our neighborhood concept, you remember there's many different ways to organize your resources within Azure. And so the virtual networks provide a method to connect all those resources, sometimes uh, within resource groups, sometimes across resource groups, uh, but always within an Azure region. So. An Azure region, remember, is a physical location within Azure, an actual data center. And the virtual network acts as our pathways of connection between devices that are launched into that, network, into that uh, region. So if we have multiple virtual machines or we have one of the other Azure services that's launched, all of those can be deployed or most of them can be deployed to our virtual network or to one of the subnets in our virtual network. So let's talk just a few minutes about what a virtual network actually is and how it's actually implemented in Azure. A virtual network is a collection of Ethernet cables and switches uh, that allow you to um, allow these resources to talk. So when we say we have a virtual net with one or two subnets, that means we have a collection of number addresses that are assigned to these machines. And we've divided that collection of numbers into one or more sets. So let's say on virtual ne network two here, we have the numbers 192.168.1.0 all the way through 128. Well, that might be subnet one. And subnet two might be the same numbers, 192.168.1.129 through 254. So that would be the second half of that, or the other subnet. And devices that are launched would receive a number within that set, and then they would belong to either subnet one or subnet two. And then with those subnets, where we can apply things like security groups, or we can, uh, we can apply security groups to limit communication between the subnets, or we can also just use them as organizational units. So we know that everything in subnet one has to do with accounting, or everything in subnet two has to do with our internet backend. It's an excellent way to divide uh, your resources in a logical way. So now let's take a look at our just couple of points here. Uh, the virtual networks in Azure do very closely mimic the virtual networking, or excuse me, uh, real world or on-premise networking. So they're, they're very close in concept and in implementation to a real world network. 
Each subscription region can have many virtual networks, but a virtual network cannot span across regions. Azure does have a facility, does have uh, the capability or the feature set to link virtual networks across regions, but a single virtual network has to exist within a single region because it is a physical uh, location and the virtual network is actually represented by some sort of networking gear uh, that spans across those machines or resources. And then finally, because they mimic real-world networking, Azure gives you a ton of options for how to combine and create complex networks that mimic your on-premise network or make logical divisions uh, in any way you really see fit. Uh, you really, it's up to your imagination and your ingenuity on how to combine these networks and make something that um, works for your company and your application. So that's it for our virtual networks video. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you'll join us for the rest. Thanks, bye. Hi, and welcome to our video on understanding virtual machines in our Azure concept series. The purpose of our video today is to provide you with a high level introduction to Microsoft Azure using an oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference that helps you to move forward. Now what we mean in the context of virtual machines is that we're gonna explain to you today how virtual machines work in Azure, what exactly they're used for, how you accomplish that task with this virtualized physical device, and what the idea of virtualization actually means for these machines. So let's jump over to our diagram and we'll take a look at how first virtual machines are organized in Azure. And then we're going to take a look at a couple of key points. Virtual machines are organized into resource groups and launched into virtual networks, which we discussed in a previous video. So the virtual machines can be organized or grouped by these resource groups and by these subnets in virtual networks to allow them to talk to each other and also allow you to administrate them in groups that make logical sense for your, for your company. So now the points about what exactly is a virtual machine? A virtual machine is basically just a, an abstraction or representation of a physical computer. If you look at the computer on your desktop, maybe you have a desktop, maybe you have a laptop, uh, maybe you're watching this on a tablet, but all of those devices share very common characteristics. They all have a monitor. Most of them have a keyboard, or in the case of a tablet, they have a virtual keyboard or keyboard that appears on screen. They have a hard drive, they have RAM, and they have some sort of operating system software on them. In addition, the laptop and the desktop might have what are called net network or NIC cards, network interface card, uh, or they might also have wireless uh, radios or transmitters that act as NIC cards. Well, in Azure and in all cloud services, the providers of these resources have virtualized all of those physical components of these machines. And what that means is that they have come up with digital representations of those devices, and not digital models or where they actually look like them, but they function exactly the same. So when you spin up a virtual machine in Azure, you're actually spinning up a virtual a machine that has some dedicated amount of processing power or some dedicated number of processing cores, a certain amount of RAM that's dedicated to it, a hard drive or some sort of disk storage that is also dedicated to its use, and an operating system. And in Azure, those operating systems are either going to be Linux or Windows. That's the two that are available through virtual machines in Azure. So now that we know a little bit about what goes into a virtual machine, what do we use them for? Well, in Azure and in all cloud services, the virtual machines act as your workhorse resources. They're what's actually going to do your computational work. And whether that computational work is serving a web page, 
or chewing through some process that uh, is making a calculation in a spreadsheet or a database table. Those are all processor intensive or process, processor engaging activities. And then it's also going to be where you store your data in memory while you're operating on it. So that's what gets stored in RAM. So if we have a calculation of a database table, we're going to pull that into RAM. We're going to operate it on, on it with our virtual processor. And then we're going to return that data somewhere, either to a monitor or a screen that's being displayed uh, somewhere, maybe over a web page, or to another storage space. In addition to this, one of the other reasons that these are the workhorse resources and that they're a very important component of, of Azure and of cloud services is that virtual machines tend to be the highest cost center of most, most Azure and most cloud deployments. So, when you put together a cloud deployment or an entire cloud application, usually the most expensive component of that application are your virtual machines or your compute resources. And so because of that, there are a number of tools that have uh, been implemented by Azure and other cloud providers to help you manage the cost and manage the life cycle of those devices. It's not really important to understand what those tools are right now, but just know that there are many tools available to help you manage the cost and the amount of usage you will incur in those expensive devices. That's really it for virtual machines. We just want to leave you with the idea that these are the workhorse computers that you will be using and that each cloud provider, and specifically Azure, virtualizes all the components. So when you set up a virtual machine, you set up a NIC card, you set up a hard drive, you set up an IP address if it has a public IP address or a private if it has a private IP address. Uh, and you then set up the OS, the processor, and the RAM. And you launch that as a complete package. So just remember when you're hearing about virtual machines, they're basically exactly like a computer, but just launched into a data center that you can't see. Thanks for joining us for this video, and we hope you'll join us for the rest of the series. Thanks. Bye. Hi, and welcome to our video on understanding storage in our Azure Concept series. The goal of our video today is to provide a high-level introduction to Microsoft Azure using an oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference that helps you to move forward. Now, what do we mean by that in the context of storage? Well, storage is basically just a place to put your data. There are many ways to implement a storage architecture, and several cloud providers do it in slightly different ways. but the most part they're very similar and so we're going to talk a little bit about general distributed storage uh, which is the kind of storage that cloud providers use and then we're going to talk about what types of specific storage azure has built on top of that and how it makes azure unique as a service so let's go ahead and go over to our diagram and we'll see that again how azure's um, how Azure organizes its resources is into resource groups, regions, and subscriptions, something we've seen over and over again in all of our videos here. And storage is no different. So when you have a storage account, uh, you put a storage account into a resource group and that uh, allows resources to use that um, storage account for storage of their data. Now that sounds slightly redundant, uh, but it's important to understand that uh, you have to have a place to store your data and you have to have a place to store the hard drives um, and the disks, virtual disks that are used by things like OS. And you also have, a pla have, have to have a place to store things like database tables and things like that. So the storage account that sits inside a resource group in Azure is where you do that. So now let's talk just a minute about our the idea of distributed storage. So cloud, re cloud providers use this idea of distributed storage as a way to provide a fault tolerant, highly available system for you to build your compute resources and your data storage architecture on top of. So if you remember in the very first video in this series, we talked about those terms, fault tolerance and high availability. And what does it mean that they are 
those that those qualities are built into storage uh, fundamentally. You don't need to design for it. The designers of the Azure service have already thought about how to do that. And the way they accomplish that is by using a distributed file system, uh, very similar to Hadoop, if you've heard that term before. If you haven't, don't worry about it. What it means is that your storage and your data is spread out across multiple computers and multiple physical hard drives. So by doing that, they give you a single point of entry to multiple copies of your data. So when you make a copy of your data onto a hard drive or into a database table or uh, into a, an Azure storage blob uh, for use with a web page, that data is automatically copied to three systems. And those three systems are set up in a way that they are fault tolerant, meaning that they are not in the same network rack or attached to the same network switch or attached to the same power supply. So they're automatically uh, fault tolerant and there, there's a router built in front of them that lets you go to the fastest one or the one that's available in the case of a failure of one of them. That means that they're highly available. So because Azure has uh, organize this system or design this system in that way, it gives you two of the qualities that you want out of a cloud system right out of the box without you having to do anything. So that's an excellent reason to use cloud storage. So now let's talk a little bit about why Azure is unique among uh, cloud providers in the way that they organize their storage. Most of the cloud providers have an idea of blob storage and disk storage, which Azure does have. Uh, they also have the idea of database storage, which Azure also does have. But what Azure has are these, um, these basic uh, tools here, the tables, queues, and files. Actually, I'm sorry, queues is actually used by a number of them as well, but tables and files are something that are unique to Azure. And they go, uh, let's talk about files first. So files actually mimic something that exists in the Windows world already, which is file share. So if you work at a company now, you probably have a shared drive where you uh, store your files uh, that you might use or share with colleagues at your office or maybe between uh, remote locations. Well, Azure has taken that idea and provided a place for your IT department to set up those network shares without having to have a server attached to them. It's a great model for Windows-centric companies um, and is an easy way for you to move applications uh, and data from on-premise location into the cloud uh, without having to replicate a whole bunch of expensive hardware. And then let's talk a little bit about tables. So tables are things are almost like shared Excel spreadsheets or shared small databases. So in the past, um, Windows or Microsoft has provided tools like Access uh, or you know SQL Server Lite as very small uh, ways to have a small database that you might use for uh, a small application. Uh, maybe it's single office use or personal use or something that is needed to maintain or to make your job easier. Well, Azure has provided a way to use those types of data storage without having to have the software or the hardware to back that up. You can actually just spin up a table in an Azure storage account and then you have access to that type of tabular storage without having to have the backup software or hardware. And then finally, Azure also has SQL databases and data lakes. Now, that's not unique among uh, cloud providers, but they are uh, unique in that they're the only cloud provider that provides SQL server software as a service as opposed to having to have a virtual machine with SQL Server uh, operating with Windows uh, with Windows Server SQL Server operating system installed on it. Now this gives you the op the opportunity to actually take advantage of one of the other two or two of the other aspects of cloud services for SQL Server which is uh, scalability and elasticity. So if you have a SQL Server application that um, is uh, has variable traffic or is something you intend to grow, well, you can size up that SQL Server um, or increase the number of instances serving that SQL Server very easily because it's a service in Azure and it is not actually attached to a virtual machine as it would be in other services. 
So that's it for storage. Um, it's basically the place to put your data. And uh, if you uh, want to understand storage a little bit more, there actually quite a bit of reading on the storage architecture on the Azure blogs. I can put that in the course notes uh, if you're interested in taking a look there. Um, it's actually one of the one of the items where um, the engineers at Azure have put a lot of information out because they want people to understand how their data is actually structured and stored so that they feel secure about putting their data uh, into the cloud and away from hard drives that they might control. So thank you for joining us for this video, and we'll hope you'll stick around for the rest of the series. Thanks. Bye.